this is Eric from Cafe Watercolor. Thank you for joining me. Today we're going to look at this closed figure painting that I did early this year. So this painting is referenced from a photo of my cousin. She visited Japan this spring, and in the photo she's wearing a kimono. So I like the lighting and the hair on the left photo, but I like the angle of the figure on the right. So the challenge will be to combine both together to have the hair and the face of the left and the figures of the right and then the lighting of the left. And to be able to pull that off, a solid understanding of fundamental form and lighting is necessary. Because it will be difficult to improvise if you don't know how the lighting works and how the basic form works. So I started with just a rough sketch and after doing the initial gesture lines, I slowed down just a little bit and I start to go into a little bit more detail on the face and the hair. Getting a landmark, the anchor point down. So when I paint, I don't need to figure those out again. So as I mentioned, I like how her head turning away and showing a lot of her hair and her hair under the sunlight is simply beautiful. So that's what I'm drawing right now. So I'm getting the anchor point down, which is uh, around her eyes, the bottom of her nose, her chin, just the important points that holds the drawing together. So when I paint, I don't need to figure those out again. Because watercolor is tricky by itself. You need to pay attention to the timing on top of the color and everything. So if you don't figure out your drawing at the drawing stage and you're trying to improvise in the painting stage, it will just add on to your stress and potentially ruin your painting. And now I'm moving down to her body. I'm just roughly sketching the folds the form of the sash on her waist. So looking at the other photo again, you'll notice why I choose this one for the body part instead of the other one because this one shows a lot more form turning when she just turned a little bit. The other one is directly to the back so it looks a little bit more flat. But again, I like how the lighting is showing the form on the other one. So that's why I'm trying to combine the bows. This is not a, a new figure painting, so you can get away with the proportion a little bit off. But it shouldn't be way off. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be like the neck is too long or the, the arm become too long. It still has to be convincing and believable. So here comes the first wash. I'm using a brush that's actually quite big for this. Now that I look at it, I actually don't need the brush that big. But I think it's a good practice that you use a brush that's bigger than you need. Just so that it will force you not to focus on too much detail and slow down. But for the first wash of the figure, you really just need to establish the basic skin color and to also get that dreadful white of the paper out of the way. I leave a little bit of highlight on the rim of her ear because as you can see that's where she catches some light on her face which I find that very very beautiful actually. And as the skin turned to the back of her neck, I coated it down a little bit with cerulean blue. So I purposefully paint the skin out into the hair area because you can get to cover those later with darker paint. But while the paint is still wet, I starting to add a little bit more different colors and add a little bit more darker value on the nose and the bottom of the chin. I also softened it a little bit of the back of her neck by using some clean water. Now I quickly moved down to the kimono. Now again, I leave some highlight on the top of her collar 
And that's because the clothes fold in and it creates a form that's facing the top and that is catching some light. Moving down to her arm and sleeves. So I like to play with color quite a bit during the first wash. And the reason for that is after they dry, it will be lightened up a lot because it's so wet. So I like to have a little bit of color variation. Just so on the second wash and later I have a good reference of the color that I should be using. Now looking at both photo again and my painting, you notice that I am using the form of the photos on the left and the lighting for the photos on the right. Her kimono has this very distinct fold that really shows the form well. I actually already start thinking about those when I was drawing. So this first wash down there, I go a little bit darker because I know they will be in the shadow anyways and leave some highlight on the kimono because they are the fold that is facing the light that will catch some sunlight. And I'm doing the back of her waist sash. There's probably a proper name for that part. I just don't really know. It kind of looked like a backpack. So anyways, what's important is that we really describe the form in there. So I leave some white because I know there are some patterns that I want to paint. I'm painting around them very loosely though. The point of this painting is really of just her and the light on her and just the overall feelings of, of she wearing a kimono in the spring, not the kimono itself. So I just drop in some colors of pink and blue. Those are mostly carmine and cerulean blue and those little colors that i just dropped now makes up the patterns on her body sash so on to the second wash and here's the palette so as you can see most of the color are pretty much just sort of reddish orange color for her skin. I have a warm pile and a cool pile and that's about it. I don't mix color by formula. I trust my eyes. I mean there are certain go-to color that I use but a lot of it is just intuition. Like obviously when I'm mixing skin color I'm not going to use a lot of Burn Umber or Cobalt Blue. I use them a little bit in the very dark area, but right now I'm doing the second wash. So I'm using a little bit of Cerulean just to cool color off, but most of the color will just be cadmium red and orange and mix with some burnt sienna just to dark the color down, to mute the color down. Just because I'm painting the shadow part of her face doesn't mean I started slapping a lot of burnt umber because that's going to make the color very dirty very quickly. Now see I leave the light on her jaw area because if you look at the photo it's catching a little bit of light and I really want to get that soft light in. So I leave that area light and I just soften the edge with a clean brush. Now darken her ear and carefully keep that highlight of her ear there. Now 
and I just start to paint the shadow that's on her neck. So what happened here is that there's a little soft light catching on her jaw, and there's light on her neck, but there's cast shadow from her hair onto her neck. So that edge, so that edge will be sharp because cast shadow are mostly hard edges because the light got blocked out versus from light to dark that's because her form is turning away from the light source that's why it's gradually getting darker instead of the light getting blocked out those are the important fundamental things that you need to understand in order to make convincing painting with a nice looking lighting So a little bit darker on her jaw area and the left side of her neck. So as you can see, her face now has a lot more form going on because of the light and the dark contrast and the different edge quality. Now I'm moving down to her kimono and this time I want to just Put some of the pattern on her clothes in first and to glaze them over later as well as adding some dark shadow right underneath her collar. Again those patterns are loosely painted in because that's not the focus of the painting. They just need to be there for people to know that there's patterns on the clothes. The fold and the form of her clothes is far more important than those patterns. So when I look at a reference photo, I will try not to look at look into all the patterns. Instead, I'll focus on the lighting and the folds, the form. Now I started to add some form shadow the darker area of the her clothes, her collar. For this one, I want to keep things mostly light and nice and vivid because it's springtime and she's wearing this vibrant pink kimono and I don't want a lot of dark color there per se. I want the lighting described mostly by the different transparency of the paint. So for the shadow area, I might mostly just paint with the same saturated color of pink and blue, just that they will be more opaque. And there's a seam on her back of her kimono and I really want to put that in because that little bit of edge is really beautiful and it really shows the form of her clothes. So we have a very thin edge and as it comes down, it become wider and turn into shadow and I just have that merge with the shadow on her back. And while I'm working on her clothes, you can see that her face and her neck, that area is pretty much dry. And you can see how light that is still. And just because of that little bit of contrast I put in, you start to see the form very, very well without losing a lot of light. And that's the thing, she's under the sunlight and an open area. So even though she's getting a lot of sunlight and some shadows, there's a lot of ambient light. 
So even the shadow area has some brightness to it. And it's closer to what we see with our eyes too, because because when we're looking at the shadow area with our own eyes, our eye will adjust to it and to see a lot of detail inside. While when you paint from a photo, you need to be really careful because the photo will tend to crush the dark a little bit more, bring out more contrast. That's the job of a digital camera. The job of digital camera is to capture an exciting image and that usually means a more contrast image. So the value range of the photo that's captured by camera is simply data from dark to light, right? From black to white. While our eyes see it a little bit differently, our eyes see a lot more detail in the shadow. So when you paint something that has nice contrast, light in the shadow, still pay attention to what's in the shadow. Sometimes there are things in there that you don't want to totally just paint it out with dark value. Use your very, very dark sparingly. Like what I'm doing right now, I am painting some dark value where the body sash touches the back of her clothes because that's the part that is getting so close together is touching each other so no lights are getting in. And I move it down to her sleeve. She has this really wide sleeve that is causing a lot of fold. So for the dark part of her clothes, I use a little bit more alizarin crimson. That will darken the color down a lot while still have some nice vibrancy. Right now, I am very busy preparing the online course that I'm aiming to release August. I might delay that uh, for a month, depends on my progress, because there's a lot to do. I record a lot of videos already, but uh, as you know, I need to edit them and I need to put them together. So it will take some time, but I'd rather do it right than just push this thing out with a lot of issues. But I thank you for all your support and your patience. It is coming out this year, so please stay tuned for that. And again, it's going to cover everything from drawing fundamental to the basic of watercolor, how to do clean washes, mixing colors, things like that, and the material that I use. But what's really different is that I include a lot of fundamental drawing from perspective to lighting. And I believe those are very, very important. And that's like the skill that you should be building on top. So if you're trying to learn watercolor, that should be a skill that's building on top of your fundamental drawing skill. If you want to paint things that's more believable and realistic. If you're painting things abstract, that might be okay. But for the things that I paint that's based on real world, I want to make them believable. Have a solid drawing fundamental skill and the knowledge of lighting, how the perspective work is really, really important. For next month, I will take a pause on the monthly video because I will be focusing on editing my course, but I'll still put out some quickies for you. And now I start to work on the hair. What I usually like to do is to mix a color that I think it looks okay on the palette. And I do a little test on the paper itself. And if it's okay, I will make some more and continue on. Make sure it's pretty dry. So I get some nice dry brush textures, which is perfect for the hair because hair has a lot of complex highlight. And to do them one by one will just be madness. So I like to use the dry brush texture on the rough paper to describe those highlights. And those are usually very effective for me. So the hair next to her ear are very light. So I just put them in and use clean water to soften it up. So that sort of melts into her skin color. Have a nice and soft transition. 
uh, I start to go a little bit more adventurous with my color. So adding some blue and some purple, some pink, some red on her hair. As long as the value is correct, you can go a little bit crazy on the hair color. As long as the dominance color is the local color, which is a little bit brown, uh, reddish brown in this case. I think there might be an Instagram filter to make everything sort of reddish looking. So I quite like that on the hair, so I'm going to use that on the hair, but for her skin and everything else, I'm still going to use my usual mix. So see how much color that I put in for the hair. But it still works together because the value is in the right range. Somebody probably do the hair for her because there's the hair looks actually really complicated and that's why I like it because you can just by seeing the highlight on the hair in the photo there's a lot of different direction wrap on her hair that almost looks like a flower and that's what I really love about it so to paint that in is very difficult so I try to just to use couple stroke leaving some shape of highlight to suggest the complication of her hair and I just drop in some dark in some areas And hopefully that will read as a beautiful hair. And this is the part that I really slow down because that's one of the focus I want in this painting. So this nice combination of warm and cool color, light and the dark on her hair, that makes it really interesting. And the flower on her hair, I'll just lightly with a clean wash and drop in some pink color. And just let the watercolor do the rest of the work. And I started dropping some really dark value on the back of her ear and put a little eyelash on it. And I just quickly paint in this purse that she's carrying which pretty much is the same color as her kimono. So I treat it as part of the clothes. And now onto the background. Now the background, I don't really have a specific reference. That's why I'm not showing any photo. I just kind of looking at uh, different cherry blossom branches and I sort of design my own. Kind of treat it more like a background and a graphic. And the way I do those flowers are just group of wet shapes with a really light pink color. This, this is not a painting of cherry blossom flower. I'm not painting each flower and flower petals. Okay, this is not a still life of cherry blossom. Splatter some pink paint. So it feels like those petals are flying. And if you visit any cherry blossom place in real life, that's how they look during the spring. So while those wet shapes are still wet, I drop in some carmine, some pink colors. And those soft shape sort of magically turn them into nice looking cherry blossom flowers. They look very abstract, but because of the branch and the content of the painting of her wearing kimono and everything, you sort of just buy them that they are cherry blossoms. Adding little drops of handsome yellow. And we're finished. Here is the finished painting. This painting is actually part of my bookmark collection that you can check out on my website. I'll put a link at the description down below. And if you're new here, please like, comment and subscribe. 
And you can visit my website at cafewatercolor.com. Sign up for my fast track watercolor PDF guide. Thank you, and I will see you next time.